Good morning and welcome to worship here today at the First United Church of East Syracuse. I don't think I have any announcements. Are there any announcements? Why don't you come up here so they can hear. A grateful thank you from the mission committee for all those who donated uh, items for the East Syracuse Elementary School. Um, today was the last day to, to bring items in, so thank you so much. Although I do know that uh, 
Suzanne and the entire Green family would like to thank Gladys and Rich and Dick and uh, Sue and all those that assisted yesterday for the celebration of life for Dave Green. It was well attended and I think everything went very well downstairs so I know they appreciate that and it was a good way to remember Dave. As has been our tradition for many years, I will now light the candle of remembrance and the candle of peace. The candle of remembrance is lit in honor of those that are serving in our military, our first responders, all of our veterans and families, and all of those who had paid the ultimate sacrifice. A candle of peace is to remind us to pray for peace in the world, peace in our communities, this nation, and in our homes, especially during these troubled times, we certainly should be praying for peace. Now, if you would stand as you are able and join me in our morning's call to worship. Each day the same, each day the same routine. Same faces at school, at work, at home. Each day the same. As we see those same places and those same faces, we get used to thinking the same thoughts. I know you. I know what to expect. Shake us up, God. In this worship time, break in anew to our patterns and expectations. Shine your light of love, healing, and hope into our plans and habits. Change up what we thought couldn't be fixed, releasing us from the boxes in which we find ourselves. Our first hymn is number 261, Lord of the Dance, is found in the hymnals and on the screen. I danced in the morning when the world was begun, and I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun. And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he I danced for the scribe and the Pharisee, but they would not dance and they would not follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John, they came to me and the dance went on. Dance then wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on the Sabbath when I cured the lame. The holy people said it was a shame. They whipped and they stripped and they hung me high, and they left me there on the cross to die. Dance then wherever you may be, I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I danced on a Friday and the sky turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. 
They buried my body and they thought I'd gone. But I am the dance and I still go on. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. They cut me down and I leapt up high. I am the life that'll never, never die. I'll live in you if you live in me. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Now, if you would join with me in the prayer of confession this morning, as found in your bulletin or on the screen. Lord God, we often fail to see the human need around us. We leave compassionate service to those who are paid to offer care. We turn our backs on those in need, letting someone else do the work. In our apathy, we reveal our selfishness and our inability to be your disciples. Stop us from our selfish ways and heal our hardened hearts. Forgive us again, as you have so often before, when we have failed to be your witnesses and workers. Bring us to an understanding of the healing and hope that abides in your service. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now as I pray the collect. Almighty God, author of eternal light, illumine our hearts by the light of your grace, that our lips might praise you, our lives might bless you, and our worship might glorify you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear now these words of pardon. Though we have failed time and time again to be God's people, Yet God heals and forgives. God is with us always, ready to lift and guide our lives. Place your life and your cares in God's loving presence. Amen. And now shall we pass the peace among us. join in the hymn when Jesus the healer passed through Galilee. You don't know this, but you'll catch on. <laughs> 
It's really simple to me. Jesus, the healer, passed through Galilee. Heal us, heal us today. The deaf came to hear and the blind came to see. Heal us, Lord Jesus. A paralyzed man was let down through the roof. Heal us, heal us today. The sins were forgiven, his walking the proof. Heal us, Lord Jesus. The death of his daughter caused Jairus to weep. Heal us, heal us today. The Lord took her hand and he raised her from sleep. Heal us, Lord Jesus. When blind Bartimaeus cried out to the Lord, Heal us, heal us today. His faith made him whole and his sight was restored. Heal us, Lord Jesus. The lepers were healed and the demons cast out. Heal us, heal us today. A bent woman straightened to laugh and to shout. Heal us, Lord Jesus. The twelve were commissioned and sent out in twos. Heal us. Heal us today to make the sick whole and to spread the good news. Heal us, Lord Jesus. There's still so much sickness and suffering today. Heal us, heal us today. We gather for healing, for healing and pray. Heal us, Lord Jesus. Our scripture readings today, our first one is from Jeremiah uh, 1, verses through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put, words, put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And now from the book of Luke 13, verses 10 to 17, and listening to our first hymn and listening to what Jesus did on the Sabbath, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then appeared a woman with a spirit that had been crippled for, her, for 18 years. 
She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I have been set free with a portable microphone. It feels good. <laughs> I want to open by reading you a story that I, I can't attribute it because I found it about 18 different places on the internet and they all say it came from somewhere else. So I'm just going to read it. It happened in a typical church. A nice church. A respectable church. One Sunday a man walked into the sanctuary, but he just didn't seem to belong. He was scruffy in appearance and his clothes were ragged. He smelled of beer, which judging from his lurching walk, he had consumed in great quantity the night before. An usher acknowledged the man with a half-hearted nod and motioned him toward an out-of-the-way pew. Ignoring his suggestion, the visitor staggered down the center aisle to the front pew and planted himself there. So far, so good, thought the usher. That is, until the pastor began his sermon. Hallelujah, shouted the visitor. The pastor gave him a stern look and continued on. Not a moment later, the visitor interrupted it again. Praise the Lord, he proclaimed. The usher came over and, and whispered to him as nicely as he could, Sir, we don't do that here. But I've got religion, the man objected. Yes, said the usher, I'm sure you do, but you didn't get it here. <laughs> Amusing, but sad. Yeah, he sure didn't get it there. It was what he was looking for. It was what filled the hole in his soul, but he didn't get it there because we don't do that here. He was a rude interruption to that worship service. In the story we heard from the gospel, talk about rude interruptions. I, I'm not going to have any more of that. <laughs> Um, in the synagogue, in came a crippled woman. Now, you don't know from your culture what's wrong with that. Women don't belong in the synagogue, they belong in the outer circle. There was a woman there, she shouldn't have been there to begin with. Secondly, she was a crippled woman, crippled by a spirit. So, there's an evil spirit in this... She brought an evil spirit into the synagogue. There's just all kinds of stuff wrong with this. The usher should have dragged her out by her hair. But there she was. And how did Jesus handle it? Jesus brought her forward. Uh-oh. You're messing now. Brought her forward and healed her. And she jumped up and was giving praise. A woman giving praise in the synagogue. He called her a daughter of Abraham. 
He elevated her status in that room. He set her free, free from the bondage of infirmity, free from the stigma of being perceived as having an evil spirit, free from the silly rule that says women don't belong here. And so he was accused. He was accused of doing something inappropriate in church. He was accused of working on the Sabbath day by healing this person. Jesus responds and says, I'm, I'm just giving what's needed to bring wholeness. That's, that's what we're all about, bringing wholeness to people. Jesus changes the rules in order to accommodate a need. The system would not allow him to reach this woman, so Jesus changed the system. You got to know when you're changing the system, not everybody's going to be happy. It ruffles feathers. We need to create an environment where everyone can be touched, and that's exactly what Jesus was doing. A woman who would have been excluded was brought in, not only brought in, but brought to the center. Do we have a system that, that prevents some people from being reached? Are some people excluded just because of our habits? That would be sad. Now anytime you have a group of people, there's no such thing as a group of people where everybody's alike. I don't know if you've noticed that. You can try to get together with friends that are just like you and it doesn't take you long to follow, find out they're not just like you. I, I want to find out just how not like you. Everybody is in the room here. So I'm going to ask some questions here. We're going to take a poll. This is all about worship and, and, and what worship is like. Um, I, and I want to start with, how, how do you go into worship? How do you start at the beginning of worship? What's the best way to get ready to worship? I'm going to give you three choices. I'll, I'll read them first, then I'll go back and we'll, we'll see who's where. Okay? Choice number one, there is quiet meditation before service, a time to center your heart, a time for prayer. That's number one, that's A. Secondly, it's a time for visiting with the neighbors that you haven't seen all week, a time of catching up, a time of building fellowship and community, a time where the church family once again unites. Or number C, number C, letter C. It's a time for singing praise songs so that you raise up your spirit. You work yourself up into an emotional high, getting ready to meet God in your sanctuary. Okay, now you got to pick one. <laughs> well, you kind of do because you can't do all three at the same time. So. <laughs> Okay, so A, quiet meditation before the service. Okay, there's, a, oh, this is going to split pretty even. We're, we're about, that's about a third. Visiting with others before the service. Uh huh. And C, singing praise songs before the service. Oh, nobody wants that. You praise song people, you get out of here. We don't want you. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to try sermons. We'll see what you like in sermons. I'm going to let you pick more than one of these. It'll just give us a, hopefully you won't say all of them, and then that's the expectation for my sermon. I, we'll see. Okay, A, sermons should be brief, to the point, and full of interesting illustrations, and should be entertaining. B, Sermons should be comprehensive treatments of a biblical text. C. Sermons should be commentaries on social and political issues of the day. D. Sermons should be practical suggestions on how to live in today's world. E. Sermons should be pep talks designed to make us feel good when we leave. Or F. Sermons should be critical appraisals designed to make us see what's the matter with us and what needs to be fixed. 
Okay, let me see how we do. Uh, who's for A? Brief, point, to the point, full of interesting illustrations and entertaining. Okay, I'm done here. <laughs> um, B, comprehensive treatments of a biblical text. We have some theologians in the room. Um, C, commentaries on social and political issues of the day. Oh, we aren't afraid to get nasty in here. All right. Um, D, practical suggestions on how to live life in today's world. Okay, that's a big one. Uh, e, pep talks designed to make us feel good when we leave. And F, critical appraisals designed to make us see what's the matter with us. Are you the uh, expired Catholics? That just <laughs> we like guilt. Bring it on. <clears throat> now, you can see that's quite a list. And can you ex imagine how uh, a sermon can be all of those things and still be brief and to the point? Yeah. <laughs> the judge is out. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to really mess. I'm going to talk about church music. What should music be like? In the, you can divide a church with music real easy. Um, okay, music should be A, dignified with the organ as the instrument of choice. This is classical kind of music. Or B, uplifting praise music designed to touch you emotionally. Or C, cool with a driving beat to get you on fire and moving for the Lord. Okay, let's see what you folks think. First, I guess so. <laughs> if it's you. Okay, dignified with organ as the instrument of choice. Um, uplifting praise music designed to touch you emotionally. Oh, pretty much same folks. Cool with a driving beat to get you on fire and moving for the Lord. Oh, cool. So, so we do a spread of things here and everybody's happy. That's a good thing. Now, if everybody had agreed on everything and that focus had been narrow, you folks would have been in real trouble because that would have said anybody else is not here. Why are they not here? Because maybe they tried it and subtly we're told, no, that's not us. But we've got a pretty good representation here, so that's a good sign. Look at all the types of God-seeking people we have here. But there's still some that have been chased off. We need to be filling stations for all souls. We need to be a sanctuary, a place where people feel comfortable to bring their, their heartaches, to bring their joys and to celebrate in front of God in a way that lifts them up. All people. There was a story from back in uh, 1988. Some of you are probably too young to, to remember back that far. but uh, Or too old to remember back that far. I don't. But there was a story about some whales that got trapped under the ice. Do you remember this? And, and they were led to freedom by some people that, with snowmobiles and ice augers. And, and what they did is they drilled holes in the ice so that, so that the whales could come up and breathe. And they made successive holes all the way out to open water so the whales could find their way out. The whales trained themselves to listen for the sound of the snow machines and the augers. And they would follow that. Three whales were trapped. Two whales survived. One whale didn't get it. One whale didn't understand. You follow the vibrations. You follow the noise. And that one didn't survive. That one didn't resonate with the system that was put in place. That one couldn't hear the offer of freedom in the way that it was presented. Our churches are to be places where people can find breathing holes. 
where they can find the life-giving substance that comes from being in contact with God. We need to be able to call all people who are in that need to our sanctuaries. How do we do that? We do that with our music. We do that with our invitations. We do that with our witness. We do that with our mission. We do it in the ways that we present ourselves to the world. We have to become attractive. And then we have to be flexible enough to adapt when people get here. I want to read you another little story off the internet. This is another one that has been around for years and years. It was written by that famous author, Anonymous. Anonymous has written a lot of stuff. It's worth looking him up because, or her, I don't know. But uh, this is about hymns and praise choruses. You'll probably resonate with one side or another. An old farmer went to the city one weekend and attended the big city church. He came home and his wife asked him how it was. Well, said the farmer, it was good. They did something different, however. They sang praise choruses instead of hymns. Praise choruses, what are those? Oh, they're okay. They're sort of like hymns, only different, said the farmer. Well, what's the difference, asked the wife. The farmer said, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be a hymn. If, on the other hand, I were to say to you, Martha, 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 oh Martha, 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 the cows, the big cows, the brown cows, the black cows, the white cows, the black and white cows, the cows, cows, cows are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, are in the corn, 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 corn. Then if I were to repeat the whole thing two or three times, that would be a praise chorus. Any of you relate to that when the praise choruses are going out? A lot of repetition. The next weekend, his nephew, a young new Christian from the city, came to visit and attended the local church of the small town. He went home and his mother asked him how it was. Well, said the young man, it was good. They did something different, however. They sang hymns instead of regular songs. Hymns, asked the mother, what are those? Oh, they're okay. They're sort of like regular songs, only different, said the young man. Well, what's the difference, asked the mother. The young man said, well, it's like this. If I were to say to you, Martha, the cows are in the corn, well, that would be a regular song. If, on the other hand, I were to say to you, O Martha, dear Martha, hear thou my cry, inclinest thy ear to the words of my mouth, turn thou thy whole wondrous ear by and by to the righteous, inimitable, glorious truth. For the way of the animals who can explain, there in the heads is no shadow of sense, hearkenest they in God's Son or His reign, unless from the mild tempting corn they are fenced. Yet those cows in glad bovine rebellious delight have broke free their shackles, their warm pens eschewed. Then goaded by minions of darkness and night, they all by mild chili wax sweet corn have chewed. So look to the bright shining day by day, where all foul corruptions of earth are reborn, where no vicious animals makes my soul cry, and I no longer see those foul cows in the corn. Then if I were to only do verses 1, 3, and 4, do a key change on the last verse, that would be a hymn. Can you relate? But notice that hymns and choruses are trying to do two very different things. Hymns are are presenting some theology. In fact, I read a study one time that Average person in the pew, when you start pushing, where do you get your theology? It comes from the hymns, not from the Bible. They'll quote to you hymn verses, usually thinking it's the Bible, but it's what stuck with them. It's an intellectual uh, exercise to sing a hymn. It's also a musical test of your classical training 
that try to follow all the harmonies through the hymn. A praise chorus, on the other hand, is repetitious. You would might say monotonous, but you get caught into a rhythm. And it always has a formula. And it starts out slow and soft, and then it builds, and it gets bigger and bigger, and you're swept up in it, and it's like counting your rosary. The first couple times you think, why am I doing this? But when you get to the end, you say, wow, I feel different. It's emotional. It's about getting caught up in something. It's about realizing that you have come down to the center. You haven't been distracted by a million ideas, but you've been focused. Two very different things. Is one better than the other? Are peaches better than apples? Well, they're both good. I'm going to make a bold assertion. What's appropriate for church? This is a dangerous place to go, but I'm going to take a risk. You can throw me out later. Appropriate behavior in church is that which helps foster one's relationship to God. And inappropriate behavior is that which blocks the development of one's relationship with God. End of story. So if it works, it's appropriate. If it brings people together with God, it's appropriate. If it blocks someone from coming close to God, it's inappropriate. One time, uh, I was a little worried because I was, a, I was an associate pastor in a church for a while, and uh, it was children's sermon time, and I had a bunch of little kiddies in front. It was children's day, so there were more kids than usual. And I got done with my little gig and I thought, well, it's Children's Day, I'm going to give each one of them a piece of candy. So I gave them each a piece of candy. And then I looked out and there were two or three kids scattered about the congregation that were too chicken to come down front. So I took the candy and I went, (laughs) Next day, three different people went to the staff parish relations committee to say the pastor was throwing candy in church. Somebody could have been hurt. It was such a bad example to set in front of the kids. They had a big whole long thing. I thought I was going to be in trouble, but the good news is that between the time I did that and the time they got to the staff parish, they got confused about which pastor did it. (laughs) And my senior pastor took the blame. It was great. It was a... I thought of doing it again the next Sunday. But But who was that candy for? You know, the kids I threw it to thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. It's like, oh, he isn't such a stuffed shirt after all. He's one of us. They connected. And they thought, well, maybe next time I can go down front. I won't be afraid of that guy because he, he connects with me. I think it was appropriate. I'd argue that. Of course, I didn't have to argue it. I just said, yeah, that jerk does stuff like that all the time. We have to stick to our mission and keep the mission central to what we do and not worry so much about what it looks like when we do the mission. Do you know what your mission is? What the first United mission statement is? Can anybody quote it? I was afraid of that. I'll help you. Growing together in our knowledge and love of God through Jesus Christ and sharing this with others. Who are the others? All the others? All the others who look like us? All the others who look like us and like the same things that we like and or all the others. As a church, we can strive to be everything the world needs to find a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we do what the church, if what we do in church discourages that, then our behavior is inappropriate and we should cut it out. One of the difficulties, though, that we face 
If you've ever been on a visioning committee, you come to this pretty quickly. You have to decide, can we do it all? Or can we only do this much? And if it's this much, how do we divide that work up? You know, you have to decide, is our church going to be a specialty shop, a niche church for straight white 60 to 80 year old conservatives? Is that, a, is that who we're going to be and we're going to reach out to others like that? Because we're a comfortable place for that. Or are we going to take seriously this make disciples of all nations and so we're going to open up like this and then, then we have to decide okay, do we need a service for the 60 to 90 year old white conservatives and another service for the liberals and another service for the tongue talkers and another service for the hand wavers and uh, how are we going to make that work? Or do we become instead of a shopping mall like that, do we become a department store where one location we do it all. We have something in the service for everything. So we'll have a guitar and some drums for one of the hymns, one of the praise songs, and then we'll have, uh, it, we'll close with a, with a Bach fugue, and uh, you have the capability of that already. And uh, a little bit of everything. They used to call that the blended worship. A little something for everybody. I, I like to say it's, the, in the blended worship, there's something for everybody to hate. And, and often that's the way it's viewed. You know, why, why are you doing that? I hate when you do that. As if the whole church service was about me. You notice there were differences here in what people preferred. So what are we going to do about that? Do we just make sure ours wins? Well, that's not a very welcoming thing to do. Will we allow the needs of others to interrupt our pious activity and sacred routines? Hopefully so. Will we notice and respond to the opportunities that God puts before us to serve, or will we be so caught up in ourselves that we ignore the needs that are at hand? That we ignore the person that's waiting in the outer circle? When we see hunger, will it tear us away from our full tables? When we see a neighborhood where people are lonely, will we leave the comfort of our own homes and reach out? When we know that one is grieving, will we swallow our own discomfort with the topic of death long enough to sit with them and be with them? When we're aware of a sister or brother heading down the wrong path, will we cross the divide of privacy and offer some words of guidance? When we know that there are thousands in our area who need and want an invitation uh, to fellowship in Jesus Christ where we risk a little bit of social awkwardness in order to make that offer and that invitation? Will we allow these things to interrupt our churchy habits the way Jesus allowed it to interrupt His? Will we be truly invitational and welcoming? We are growing together in our knowledge and love of God through Jesus Christ and sharing this with others. The church that survives and thrives in this century will do these things sensitive to changing needs, sensitive to changing tastes. True worship is honoring God authentically, celebrating who God is honestly, openly, publicly. If church frees us to do that, then church works. If church keeps us from doing that, it needs to be torn down. Let's be willing to put ourselves forward to try new forms of worship, to be open to interruptions, to be ready for that staggering stranger who comes forward and yells hallelujah. Let's be ready for that in our hearts and our minds. 
and embrace it as an opportunity to bring someone into a relationship who never found a place before. Let's support anything that brings anyone nearer to God. Remove any stumbling blocks that hinder them from coming. Reaching out with arms of welcome to every person who comes into our lives, especially those who come through our doors. Then those in need will find wholeness. The crowd will rejoice. And the Lord will be glorified. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, dear Lord, that we might be people that are a comfortable place for others. That we might be a witness that the God that is within us might communicate with the God that is within them. For we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it's time for our offering. For those here in attendance, <clears throat> you may leave your tithes and offerings in the little brown basket in the narthex. And for those at home worshiping through social media, we ask that you mail your pledges and offerings to uh, the church at 823 Franklin Park Drive, East Syracuse. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit. Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. If you now join me in our dedication. Mighty God, bringing bring our tithes and offerings to you today, we pray over them and, and sing your praises. Then we slink back into our day-to-day -day lives, hoping those gifts meet the expectations of our discipleship. You have called us to more, to speak for you, to make our testimony part of our offering, which terrifies us. Then Scripture reminds us that you will provide us with the words. Give us the faith and courage to speak of your love, mercy, and compassion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And we're going to do our joy. So actually, I'll start. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who supported Sophia with her fundraiser. Um, it has helped us greatly. It's a huge amount of money um, to, to raise. So for those of you that supported her, thank you so, so, so much. And if anybody wants to, there's a couple left. So <laughs> thank you guys again. And I want to thank Reverend Swanson for being here today as our guest pastor. It's always a joy to have you lead us in worship. Thank you. Oh, stop. Anyone else? This is just a quick concern. The last song is listed at 59, and if you look at 59, it's not there. But the joy is that I found it. It's 593. <laughs> you ran out of threes, I guess. <laughs> As you probably know why I'm here, um, the Ladies Tea and Jill, J. Jill's Fashion Show is on September 24th between 12 and 3. 
I am looking for hostesses and models. Now, hostesses basically consist of getting a table, you decorate it however you like, you bring your own table service. It does not have to be China or anything like that. We have had in the past uh, Phantom of the Opera. We've done Japan. We've done Easter. We've done SU themes. We've done a wedding table. So the choice is yours. Basically, what a hostess does is get your people. You collect their ticket money, and you enjoy the day. Now, a model basically will go to J. Jill's one or two weeks prior to the 24th. You will select outfits that you will be modeling. And J. Jill's will tag it and bring it to the church. So after our lunch, which will consist of sandwiches, fruit, and a dessert, and, of course, coffee or tea, basically, and then all you do is walk in a square around the room as the MC from J. Jill's describes your outfit. So this is what I'm going to be looking for. I'll give you next week, and I'll be out in North X to, to see how things will go. And I thank you. Anyone else? Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. O oh, gracious God, our worship adds nothing to your greatness, but without worship we would diminish everything. We lift our hearts and voices in gratitude for the opportunity to worship, for this place in which to render worship, and for the church of Jesus Christ whose spirit always informs our worship and sometimes inspires us to reform our worship. Renew our appreciation for the church as the body of Christ and for ourselves as its members, open to your guidance and committed to your service. As Christ has opened the door of your kingdom to all your children, let us open the doors of his church to all your children. Help us to be the answer to his prayer that we all become one in him. Nurture in us the spirit of love that reaches out across social and cultural differences. Help us to appreciate one another in all our diversity. Give us the will to extend a helping hand to whomever is in need. We thank you, O oh God, this day for the many opportunities that are before us. We thank you for the response to, to Sophia's need we thank you for the ladies' tea and, and fashion show, which will, which will be an outreach to people, an opportunity to engage people where they are. Everything that interrupts our regular schedule can be turned into an opportunity when we see it as engaging your children. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, the Anointed One, who defied tradition, who put his heart before the rules, and who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Shall we join in the hymn 593? Here I am, Lord.
I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you Hold your people in my heart. Will you receive the benediction? May the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, who lives to disturb and heal us, bless you with the power to go forth and proclaim the gospel by your words, by your deeds and by your very lives. Amen.